Good evening. Welcome to the April 5th, 2021 evening budget hearing. This is the third budget hearing. I'm City Manager Ed Zerker. Thank you for joining us. Before we go further this evening, this is our District 1 hearing. I'll ask our interpreter, Spanish language interpreter, Mario Barajas, to introduce himself uh, to the audience. Thank you, Ed. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mario Barajas, and I will be serving as Spanish interpreter for today's virtual budget audience. I can't kindly ask as a favor if uh, you will be providing a public comment. Please try to speak slowly and clearly so that I can try to interpret what you're saying as completely as possible. Thank you. Now, to avoid any confusion, I'm going to review uh, and provide instructions in uh, how to access the meeting in English. And then afterwards, I'm going to give the same instructions, but for our Spanish audience. If you're going to be participating or listening in through the telephone, you're going to have to dial 602-666-0783. Uh, and enter meeting ID 187-172-1915 and then pound. And then press pound again when prompted for the attendee ID. I will now take this time to introduce myself to our Spanish speaking audience. Muy buenas tardes a todos. Mi nombre es Mario Barajas. Estaré sirviéndoles como intérpretes para la audiencia de presupuesto virtual de hoy. Les pediré como favor, si es que va a estar dando un comentario público, que hable despacio y deténgase después de cada pocas oraciones para que pueda interpretar lo que esté diciendo de la manera más completa posible. Muchísimas gracias. Ahora les voy a indicar cómo acceder a la audiencia por teléfono en español si es que no lo ha hecho. Va a marcar el número de teléfono 602-666-0783. Introduzca el número de identificación o ID de la reunión que viene siendo 187-923-9323 y luego el signo de número, o sea, el pound. Introduzca nuevamente el signo de número o pound cuando se le solicite el número de identificación o ID de asistente. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Mario. So this evening, I'll introduce our host, District 1 Councilman and Vice Mayor Thelda William in just a moment. Then I'll have some housekeeping. We'll see about an eight minute video and then we will go to, um, go to speakers. So as I mentioned, this is the District 1 budget hearing. I want to uh, thank Vice Mayor Thelda Williams for hosting. Uh, we are joined by Councilwoman-elect Ann O'Brien this evening as well. Councilman-elect O'Brien will be inaugurated on April 19th. Uh, she did want to join for this hearing uh, as well, and uh, she, she's with us as well, so thank you. I want to uh, turn it over for opening comments now to Vice Mayor Thelda Williams. Uh, I wanna mention this is the Vice Mayor Williams' final uh, District 1 budget hearing. Vice Mayor Williams has served the city of Phoenix uh, in two distinctly different uh, council terms uh, over the last uh, 30 plus years, as well as three different times serving as mayor of the city of Phoenix. She has been a tremendous advocate for District 1, but also for the entire city of Phoenix. She's been a great leader for city employees and uh, has uh, many accomplishments under her belt, including the desert preserves that we all enjoy uh, and many other projects. Um, I, I figured out that Thelda has probably uh, hosted over 40 different District 1 budget hearings in her time as a council member and as mayor. So that's truly a remarkable track record and on behalf of all city employees, I wanna express deepest appreciation, uh, Vice Mayor, for your leadership of the city and we're pleased to join you here in this budget hearing and I will turn it to you. Well, thank you, Ed, those are very kind remarks. I really appreciate it. And I also want to thank our Councilwoman-elect O'Brien for joining us tonight. I know that people often don't take time to attend these meetings, but I hope that they realize that the comments they make are taken into the final draft of the budget and they can make a difference. So I welcome everyone who's tuned in, plans to speak. 
And thank you very much. Anne, did you have any comments you wanted to make? Thank you so much, Vice Mayor Williams, for letting me co-host tonight with you. I'm so excited to um, be hearing from our constituents and appreciate your great leadership for all these decades in the City of Phoenix and District 1. Thank you. Okay, Ed, we're back to you. Thank you, Vice Mayor, and thank you, Councilwoman-elect O'Brien. And just a note, I did confirm with the Councilwoman-elect that her virtual background is the Dean Hills which we'll hear a little bit about in a minute with, with our budget presentation. So thank you for that uh, synergy of the budget and your, your virtual background. Um, in the audience with me today uh, at the table is our budget and research director, Amber Williamson, who has led, this is her first uh, time through the budget as budget director. So thank you, Amber, for being here and for the work you've done. Thank you to the budget and research staff who are all here uh, staffing uh, the hearing taking minutes and making sure that everything runs smoothly. So we uh, have every year a process in the city of Phoenix where the city manager issues a trial budget designed to elicit community comment. This year we have $153 million of surplus, of which about $100 million is one-time money to, that should be spent on one-time things. But this is a remarkable uh, amount of money to be able to spend on community priorities. And so we're very pleased to be able to present that to the community for feedback. As you'll see in the video, the priorities are broken into six large areas that have to do with things like administrative accountability, COVID response, uh, growth, responding to growth, and uh, the largest single one has to do with public safety, transparency, and accountability, and you'll get a full explanation of that. The information in the budget video is summary in nature. For full details, we invite people to look for, this is the hard copy version that is contained on the city's website, phoenix.gov slash budget. And there's as much detail there as you would care to spend time on from 15 minutes to 15 hours worth of budget material and information that will describe in detail uh, the information that you'll see in the trial budget. The uh, feedback you get is captured here live in this broadcast. It is also on the city's YouTube channel, the Phoenix TV YouTube channel. It is also on the Phoenix website. So while not every council member can attend every hearing, the every hearing is available for review. We also take minutes and publish those every week for review by the entire city council. So as Vice Mayor Williams said at the beginning, the comments that we get are recorded and considered as we develop a budget proposal for the City Council in May. After the budget video, we will go to uh, Matt Heil, who will read the names of our speakers. And so with that, um, I will turn to our budget video presentation. The City of Phoenix trial budget for fiscal year 2021-22, proposed by the Phoenix City Manager, is ready for public review and comment. The goal of this trial budget is to identify programs and services that build a better, more inclusive city for all. Phoenix has a long history of public budgeting, giving the community a voice in the future of our city by starting the public involvement much earlier than required. This year, due to the pandemic, public involvement will be virtual, but our goal is that we will provide even more opportunities for you to share your feedback. We'll host virtual budget community hearings between April 2nd and April 20th in both English and Spanish by council district and citywide for youth and for seniors. And this year, we've launched the Fund Phoenix Tool, an interactive way to share what's important to you when it comes to city programs and services. The law requires the city's budget to be balanced each year. And this year, we are happy to report a projected budget surplus of $153 million, made up of $98 million in one-time funds and $55 million in ongoing funding. 
This is thanks to Phoenix's continued strong economy and sound leadership by the mayor and city council and the city's strategic use of data to direct our efforts during the pandemic. City employees have stood on the front lines of the pandemic, more than a year and counting, to provide critical services and support to our residents and customers. Approximately 77% of the surplus in the 2021-22 trial budget is allocated to employee compensation to continue to retain and recruit top talent to provide the level of service our customers rely on to stay safe, healthy, and connected. $35 million is allocated to address important needs raised by the council and the community across six areas. Focus Area 1 public safety reform and responsiveness, more accountability, responsiveness, transparency, and trust is demanded from public safety programs. In this budget proposal, the city expands an already successful fire department program where trained mental health experts respond to 911 callers needing crisis health services. The expansion of the Community Assistance Program follows community and council requests for innovative ways to respond to crisis calls for service with mental health professionals rather than police officers. This not only strengthens health outcomes, but frees up police officers and firefighters to focus on public safety calls, reducing response times for our community. In addition, the budget adds other important public safety reforms by adding additional 911 operators, reducing wait time for police public records, improving police officer accountability through an improved human resource management system, and more comprehensive reports of crime data. Focus Area 2, COVID Response and Resiliency. The city's navigated the COVID pandemic well, protecting employees and the community because we have relied on data and contracted public health experts to inform our efforts. We transitioned City Hall to an appointment-only model. We also pivoted our programs and services to support the community in need of Wi-Fi connectivity and access to emergency food support and virtual and curbside library services requiring additional staffing and technology enhancements. Funding's required to continue these efforts through the pandemic. Focus Area 3, Climate Change and Heat Readiness. Climate change and the record-breaking heat in Phoenix call for investment in strategies to address the negative impacts on our residents, particularly our most vulnerable, including seniors and those in poverty and experiencing homelessness. The trial budget includes a new Office of Heat Response and Mitigation to focus these efforts, the addition of staff to plant and maintain trees, and advance the city's Cool Corridors program, all to meet the goals of the Tree and Shade Master Plan to double the tree canopy by 2030 and reduce the impact of heat. Focus Area 4, Affordable Housing and Homelessness. The city has a lack of affordable housing and more people experiencing homelessness than ever before. The city council approved a Housing Phoenix Plan and a Homeless Strategies Plan to find solutions to identify funding to increase and improve affordable housing units and to leverage federal funding and work with community partners to help those experiencing homelessness. Funding will provide staffing and programs to foster affordable housing developments on city-owned land and ensure the safety and security of those experiencing homelessness and the impacted neighborhoods and businesses. Focus Area 5, Building Community and Responding to Growth. There continues to be a great need to connect underserved communities to the economic benefits of our city's continued growth. We will fund programs and services that foster equitable education and recreation opportunities for youth and special needs populations, including the Phoenix Public Library's College Depot, Clean and Safe Neighborhoods, and support for homegrown small businesses. Funding will support the growing needs at city parks and recreation centers, including the new Cesar Chavez Community Center, scheduled to open in the fall of 2021, Margaret T. Hance Park in downtown Phoenix, and Dean Hills Recreation Area in North Phoenix, as well as the successful inclusive recreation program for residents with special needs. 
We also propose an increase in funding for arts and historic preservation grants. Focus Area 6, Administrative Accountability. The city must continue to foster a diverse, equitable, and inclusive environment to live and work for residents and employees. To succeed, we propose to create the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. We'll also invest in technologies to support data-driven decision-making across city departments and to protect the city's IT systems from cybersecurity threats. Enhance election processes to increase engagement in city elections and connect residents to library and park services. This has been just a taste of what you will find in the 2021-2022 City of Phoenix trial budget. We hope that you'll review additional details in the budget available online at phoenix.gov slash budget. Please share your feedback in whatever way works best for you at one of our 14 community budget hearings or by email at budget.research at phoenix.gov. Through our Fun Phoenix interactive tool, you can comment on the city's social media at City of Phoenix AZ on Facebook or Twitter and use the hashtag Phoenix Budget or call us at 602-262-4800. The city manager will present his proposed budget for 2021-22 to the Phoenix City Council on May 4th, 2021. The council's budget decision will take place on May 18th, 2021. Both meetings will be streamed online and on Phoenix TV. Thank you for being part of this important process. We look forward to hearing your ideas for this year's trial budget and the future of Phoenix. All right, thank you. So we have in the audience uh, here uh, um, members, representatives of each city department that's represented in the budget. So they're here to, to listen and respond if necessary, but mostly we want to hear from the public. So with, this, that, with that, I will turn it to Matt Heil, who will uh, read the names of the speakers and lay out the ground rules. Matt. Thank you, sir. Yes, the first thing I'd like to do is read a short statement on comment, uh, conduct during public comment. Members of the public will have the opportunity to speak for up to two minutes on budget issues of interest or concern to them. Speakers must present their comments in a respectful and courteous manner. Profane language and personal attacks on members of the public, council members or staff are not allowed. A person who violates these rules can lose their opportunity to continue to speak. The Arizona Open Meeting Law permits the City Council to listen to the comments, but prohibits Council members from discussing or acting on the matters presented. And with that, our first speaker is Stanley Bates. Stanley, are you on the line? I believe I am. You are, sir. Uh, Please my proceed. Name is, uh, my name is Stanley Bates. I live at 4243 West Ironwood Drive in Phoenix. I want to say thank you to Felda Williams. She's been a champion of District 1 and the city. I look forward to working with Ann O'Brien as she takes over. And I've always enjoyed working with Ed Zuffler as our city manager. I'm also pleased to see that the recommended budget contains increased funding for our firefighters. They're an integral part to our public safety agencies. With that said, however, I do feel like our police have been almost totally ignored. During the most recent assault last week on our Capitol Police in Washington, it was mentioned that the Capitol Police are understaffed, even though they have 2,300 officers, not including 25,000 National Guardsmen still on grounds, to provide the law enforcement for the Capitol Mall. The Capitol Mall encompasses an area about 1% of the size of our city of Phoenix. It also has almost no permanent residents residing in the area it protects. Conversely, the city of Phoenix is exceptionally larger and has a population which is the fifth largest in the United States. For the record, the city of Phoenix has a maximum number of 3,125 authorized positions, but because of hiring and retention issues, that number is barely 2,900. In 2018, Chief Williams recommended hiring additional officers to bring our force up to 3,850. The city council passed that recommendation, but due to funding issues, has never authorized the hiring of additional officers. Since this is a year in which surplus funds are available, it should be a time to start implementing an increase in officers to begin meeting the 3,850 officers needed. Please consider at least starting to increase the number of officers to help protect citizens 
as violent crime is rising and our streets are being overrun with speeders causing more accidents. If the council and the mayor uh, do not agree with Chief Williams, they're not willing to hire the additional officers and perhaps they should hire a consulting firm filled with expert law enforcement professionals conduct a thorough study to determine the number of officers that are needed for city the size and then there's the population of Phoenix. Perhaps this group could also look at ways of hiring and retention of officers. Thank you for your time. Our next speaker is Celeste Scott. Celeste, are you on the line? Uh, yes, I am. Please proceed. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Celeste Scott. I'm the Phoenix Arts and Culture Commissioner for District 1, and I'm speaking on behalf of the $200,000 increase to the Phoenix Arts and Culture budget. I've worked in public visitation here in Phoenix for many years. Um, I believe the arts are very important. Um, visitors that come into our city have continually expressed how impressed they are with the visual art and design of our public spaces and parks, and basically the overall design of our, in our community. Just to highlight a few points of importance, the arts represent who we are as a community. It shows our commitment both to beautify and to educate. The artwork represents many interpretations of cultures, traditions, experiences, and it also encourages reflection. We are a very diverse community and public art and programming shows our support for this diversity. It also plays a role in community pride. Seeing the investment by the city in our programming and public spaces positively contributes to how we feel about living here, especially our locals, and how we interact with our visitors. Our community citizens are our best champions for promoting our city. Now more than ever, especially with the pandemic, these feelings of anxiety, fear, and uncertainty, through arts programming, it brings focus, um, a sense of calm and balance. It also supports engaging with others, um, definitely a much needed experience of enjoyment and renewal of positive energy. So we'd like to thank you for the support that you have given the art organizations and artists during the pandemic. We know that funds were prioritized through the budget process and emergency relief funding. So we're very pleased and hopeful that the $200,000 included um, in this budget um, remains um, that supports the Office of uh, Arts and Culture's programming and public um, art maintenance um, for both continuation and expansion. Um, so basically, we sincerely appreciate your support for this funding. Thank you. Our next speaker is Savina Babaset. Savina, are you on the line? I am, can you guys hear me okay? Yes, please proceed. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I am speaking as a resident or community member in the Bridalwood Enclave um, housing community. And I'm speaking on behalf of the item of building the park on 55th Avenue and uh, Samantha Way. And um, although I understand the need for affordable housing and, and plans around um, that, I also just want to speak as a, as a working mom and a community member, the need for more parks in the area, um, particularly for promoting community wellness. We know with the pandemic, we've seen an increase in mental illness and suicide rates of children. And so I think it's important that we also consider the needs of our children and the wellness of our community in building those parks and having places for them to go outside and, and socialize and interact with other children. Thank you. Our next speaker is Frank Steinmetz. Frank, are you on the line? Can you hear me all right? Yes, sir, we can. Please proceed. Good evening, Frank Steinmetz. I'm a proud District 1 50 year resident of 4220 West Donnerwood Drive. First, I'd like to say thank you to Thelda Williams for her many years of uh, outstanding service to our district and also uh, remind the residents that they need to go and give uh, our city manager a pat on the back for what he does every day and the value that he plays in our daily lives. I'm just going to just expound upon what Stan Bates said earlier. Uh, with the increased city population and, and retirement of so many police officers, now is the perfect time to increase the police funding. 
We need more officers to be hired. We need more CAOs. People who complain about police officers don't understand. The more you have community action officers, the more involved they are with the community. We also need multi-housing officers and school resource officers. More importantly, some of our precincts need new buildings. Many of our precincts were built without female officers being considered. Being the fifth largest city in the nation, we should have 4,000 plus uh, officers, according to the FBI, this morning. We're at about 2,900. About 70% of our current sergeants and lieutenants are eligible for retirement this year alone. So we do need to go and increase our police uh, officers and their, their budget. Thank you. Thank you, Frank, and also Stan. I just wanted to to comment a second on 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 what you're saying. I I understand and hear the call for more officers. Really, what we are what we're needing right now is to find um, people, young people particularly, who are interested in becoming police officers. Who are actively recruiting for police officers, and we have. Uh, we currently have, as you mentioned, 2,900 officers. We're currently author authorized at 3,125. So we, at this moment, get, uh, are authorized for 225 more officers than we actually have physically on the force. So our first task is to identify people who are interested and willing to become Phoenix police officers, get them in and get them uh, trained uh, to be those officers. So anything folks can do to help us identify People who are interested in becoming police officers, um, our police department has a recruiting group that is happy and interested in talking to anyone who would, who would be interested. Thank you. Our next speaker is Cynthia Garcia. Cynthia, are you on the line? Hello, Cynthia, are you on the line? I'm afraid we can't hear you. You may still be muted. IT is telling me you are on the line. Let's try just one more time and then I'll move to the next speaker. Uh, Cynthia? All right, we'll see if we can get her audio in a bit. Our next speaker is Linda Abbott. Linda, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Thank you. Please proceed. Well, thank you, Mr. Zerker and Vice Mayor Williams and city staff. I'm excited that city leadership has led us to this positive financial situation. Uh, I support this budget, especially the mental health units and the heat mitigation. Uh, I'm speaking today requesting that you add the park at 55th Avenue and Samantha Lane, Samantha Way and Levine to the budget. Uh, before the Great Recession, land was purchased according to the general plan to provide parks to Levine. But throughout Levine, that land has not been developed despite impact fees being collected for the construction of those parks. Over $9 million is available right now for the construction of neighborhood parks in our area. Although that money will begin to be eligible for a refund to landowners in about three years. So if we wait, that fund could go away. Right now, we need council to approve the cost of park maintenance in the budget. For the park on Samantha, that would only be $156,000 if we partner with the Levine Elementary School District. Multiple city staff members have told me that the city's new approach is to rely on HOAs to provide park amenities. There are several reasons this does not work. First, parks like the one on Samantha are surrounded by neighborhoods already built with zoning stipulations that required a city park, so no park amenities were provided for the residents. Second, in new developments, zoning still only requires 5% open space. A current town home developer is even proposing underground retention, eliminating the retention basin Levine currently relies on for green space. Third, many HOAs do not allow recreational use of their grass retention basins. My son's soccer practice was just ended by the police about a week ago because they were on HOA property. The park on Samantha has no city park for three miles in any direction, but it's right next to two schools with a combined student body of about 3,000 students. These children deserve a place to play. Please follow the general plan and share the general fund tax money with the rapidly growing number of residents in Levine. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ramon Gomez. Ramon, are you on the line? Yes, I'm on. Can you guys hear me? Yes, sir. Please proceed. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm also a resident of the Levine area, District 8. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm also wanting to emphasize the need for the park on 55th Avenue and Samantha Way. It is uh, highly needed. Uh, there's 
growth all over the city, which is great. Uh, south of us, uh, from Dobbins, it used to be nothing but farmlands. They're now already building. The 202 is bringing a lot of traffic. I live right across from that park on Paseo Point. Uh, there is a school right there, Paseo Point Elementary. Two weeks ago, they had a Play 60 event. Uh, they, had, they were holding it on the school grounds. Everyone in that area was crammed into that small field. If they had their park, they could have utilized that space. It's, uh, it will bring uh, the community a bit better service by not being the eyesore of the community. I've been here six years. Uh, it was a new build. It's the last phase of uh, the building in Paseo Point. When I first got here, they said the park's going to be built, the school's going to be built, and the 202 is going to be built. The last thing pending right now is that uh, eyesore. So I would highly uh, recommend that you guys add this to the budget. It'll be a fraction of what that budget amount is. Thank you so much, and you guys have a great day. Our next speaker is Frank Beaver. Frank, are you on the line? Hi, yes, I'm online. Please proceed. I'm sorry, an another resident of Levine calling to also request the funding for the park at 55th and Samantha. Uh, keep it short and sweet, but yeah, when I've been here 14 years uh, waiting for the park to be built, so glad to hear there's possibly surplus funding and I want to thank our, my neighbor, Linda, for rallying the troops to get us all to call in and support it. Thank you. And I wanted to go back and see, uh, is Cynthia Garcia on the line? Okay, it appears she's no longer on the line. So our next speaker is Ainsley Anjanu. Ainsley, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Thank you, Jeff. Please proceed. Hi, good evening. My name is Ainsley Anjunu, and I'm also a member of the Levine community. Um, I'm also a teacher here in Levine, um, so I do see um, the children every day online on our computer. Um, I'm asking to also please fund the building of the park on 55th Avenue and Samantha Way. Um, just like the others were saying, we really need to make children our priority right now. Um, this year has been pretty tough for them, and seeing them every day on the computer just shows that we really do need to encourage more outdoor play once it is safe and people are more comfortable. Um, so I'm just asking again if we could build the park so that we can encourage this outdoor play and also community building um, in a living community. Thank you. Our next speaker is Joel Copland. Joel, are you on the line? Yes, I'm online. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Please proceed. Well, thank you, Manager Zerker and uh, Vice Mayor Williams for all that you've done and for the entire community for listening to and allowing these comments to be made from the public. My name is Joel Copeland. I'm an artist. I created the mural Metroasis, the history of the city of Phoenix, which hangs in City Hall 27 years ago. I've lived and worked at 119 South 11th Avenue, which is a half a block south of the Carnegie Library at 1105 West Washington. Since we first moved in and marveled at that beautiful classical revivalist building four years ago, I was puzzled that there was never anybody there. The wonderful historic building was just standing empty, and I find now it has been for years. And it came to me, why couldn't that building be the Museum of Arizona Artists? I put together a group of art professionals, art curators, gallery people, people from, from the business community who feel the same way. We are now in the process of obtaining a 501c3 tax exempt status as the Friends of the Museum of Arizona Artists. This would be under the Arts and Culture and Historic Preservation Grants. We are seeking pre-development funds from the, pre, from the city budget to help raise the capital necessary to sustain our development plan, which will include private donations, public grants, admission fees, and other resources. This would give us space to exhibit work by Arizona artists of color, women artists of Arizona, and our indigenous cultures, as well as our local Latino artists from the South Central Phoenix. It would also be programmed for young people to understand and create art and channel energy through the creative process. This would be an economic boom to the local community and a salute to our Arizona artists, as there is no venue that ex exhibits solely Arizona artists. The light rail, I understand, is scheduled to come through by 2023, giving easier access and to draw people from all over the city with a stop right there at the museum. This is a very exciting project, and I thank you once again for your consideration in granting some funds for this building. Thank you. Our next speaker is Veronica Baca. Veronica, are you on the line? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Please proceed. Yes, my, my name is Veronica Baca. I am uh, also a resident 
of Levine District 8, and I, I am also asking that you please add a park at 55th Avenue and Samantha Way to the budget. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ginger Torres. Ginger, are you on the line? Hi, I'm here. Good Please. evening, Councilwoman Williams and Councilwoman Elect O'Brien. I'm Vice Chair of the EQSC, the Environmental Quality and Sustainability Commission. And I also chair the city subcommittee on um, Urban Heat Island Tree and Shade. Um, I was just calling in today to um, issue support for the trial budget funds for heat readiness um, in order to protect, protect our, value, our most vulnerable communities from the impacts of heat. Um, in the trial budget, especially supportive of cool quarters program. In addition, I am supportive of any of the, the budget activities that address climate resili resiliency measures to ensure that our city remains a leader in environmental sustainability. And in addition, um, I do support the, the trial budget measures that meet the goals of the tree and shade master plan. I want to bring to the attention of the councilwoman and councilwoman elect um, the memo that was sent from EQSC chair Colin Tetrout on February 19th, 2021, addressed to Mayor Gallego, council members, and city manager Ed Zercher, titled Urban Forest Infrastructure Manager Recommendation Memo. And the, the Corresponding memo, urban forest infrastructure manager position justification from the urban heat island tree and shade subcommittee. These memos go into detail on the benefits and the costs of implementing some of the measures that have been proposed in the trial budget. So I do encourage councilwoman and councilwoman elect to please read the memo and be familiar with um, the, the numerous benefits um, to city function, our city's economics, and the, the benefits that make our city and communities healthier by um, streamlining our city resources and um, the creation of the um, new office of, of heat, I think that's what it's called, office of heat um, management, um, because those, those measures will highly make our, our city more efficient. Thank you. Our next speaker is Samuel Merton. Samuel, are you on the line? Yes. Please proceed. Uh, my name is Samuel Merton. I'm a member of the Neighborhood Organized Crisis Assistance Program team in Phoenix. I'm speaking directly about the proposal to add funds to and expand the community advocacy program that is currently under the fire department. Uh, I'd like to talk about three aspects that need to be addressed in this proposal before the program is fully established. This program needs to be independent from any other department. This program needs to have community oversight and control. And there needs to be a secure and long-term funding for this program. So for independence, people do not want, people do not trust any of the current first responder departments here, and we need this to be a completely separate entity. Um, they shouldn't run background checks, report drug use, or report anyone they believe to be undocumented. Um, if you would like the trust of communities throughout Phoenix, long term, this needs to be a completely separate department and not a branch of the fire department. For community oversight, there needs to be the creation of a public ad hoc committee for community direction and oversight to make sure this program stays on track. This community to make sure that all feedback that has been given from the public um, has actually been adopted and followed through. For funding, $3 million a year is nowhere close to sufficient funding long-term. Um, Cahoots and Oregon operate on $2 million, so how can a city that's 10 times larger than that only operate on, third, on $3 million? The ongoing budget needs to be increased to $20 million a year. And since this program is taking service calls and operations, from the, Phoenix, from the police budget, the funding can be given to the department for those calls. Um, this is reallocating money to this department anyway. And I would just like to stress the importance of community involvement and engagement from the ground up. Um, Cahoots, I'm sure you guys, I know you research it, it's successful because it had 60 years to gain that trust. Phoenix doesn't have that. You have to put that into the program. 
Thank you, Samuel. I just wanted to take a minute and have Amber, uh, our budget and research director, explain the funding for it, because I think there's maybe a misunderstanding. It is not, it is not budgeted for three million per year, but the budget it has it laid out over a few years as it ramps up. Amber? Thank you, Ed. Yes, that's correct. So in the proposed trial budget, it's estimated roughly three million for the first year cost to expand the program. Once it's fully expanded, the addition of 130 additional city staff for the program, as well as contracting with a third party health provider, it's estimated it would cost 15 million annually. So the, the three million was just because the first year it will take time to ramp it up and the, the funding then would be available in the budget thereafter. So th thank you for those comments. Our next speaker is Amy Meglio. Amy, are you on the line? Uh, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, please proceed. Yeah, so my name is Amy Meglio, and while my work's main office space is located in District 4, um, as an essential worker, I do deliver to homes in any district or and every district on any given workday. Um, uh, I'm also a volunteer lead coordinator with the Grassroots Law Project and a member of NOCAP. And while we at NOCAP will be de delivering a letter to the mayor and council and city manager with 18 demands um, regarding the community advocacy program, I especially ask that you pay attention to these key points. Um, the first is total independence. Uh, the ultimate goal of this program needs to be to support people in times of crisis without the use of the criminal legal system. And while the fire department is a good place to launch the program since fire is already integrated fully with 911, um, the fire department is an inappropriate long-term home for the program. Neighborhood studies show that community members uh, calling for assistance in crisis don't want a police response or any sort of cooperation with ICE either. So it's really imperative that it be standalone. Um, key point two is community oversight and control. Um, as we've seen with the office, with the city council's attempt to uh, create the office of accountability and transparency, the city can promise one version of, of a department and then arbitrarily change that plan and disregard community input. So we won't just take the city manager's word. Uh, we want an ad hoc committee or an ordinance that requires the community advocacy program to adopt all demands listed in the NOCAP letter to city council. And then third is secure and sufficient long-term funding. And uh, thank you for, um, for explaining that there will be the increase to 15 million over time. Um, we also would like to talk about the point that this initial 15 million is advocated out of the budget surplus, but because, as we all know, operations dictate budget, since the operations of mental health 911 calls are being removed from the police department, it only makes sense that we leave that surplus money for, it sounds like there's some parks and a lot of other important community arts um, things that could use that money, um, and we should be divesting that money from the police, since, again, operations dictate budget. And that was our last public speaker. And thank you, Amy. I just wanted to also clarify, there's been some comment about uh, there needing to be money, that there's going to be savings. It is very possible over the long term that we could realize savings from a CAP program because it does reduce the, the stress on, nine, on uh, police, fire, and others. I Certainly the city council, as those savings are identified, as the program is implemented, the city council will uh, be able to allocate those funds. We just don't know what those are right now, so we don't think it's wise to promise something that we don't have any way to identify uh, what that might be. But we're certainly going to be looking for any possible savings that come because of the different response from the cap. So appreciate the, the uh, input on that. And with that, Matt, is that our final speaker? Yes, sir, that was the final speaker. Wonderful, so thank everyone for joining us. I would like to turn it back to Vice Mayor Williams and Councilman-elect O'Brien for any closing comments. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Ed, and thank you, Matt, for your hard work. I wanna thank everyone who called in. It makes a difference, and I think it's very important that we do listen and record your comments. So I know many of you attend more than one budget hearing. Keep it up, you're the voice that makes the change. Thank you very much, and thank you, Ann, if you were Councilwoman-elect. Did you want to make a comment? Thank you again for letting me um, join you, and I do appreciate all the folks who have come on and are participating in the process. It, it is vital to um, our city and our communities that people participate. 
Thanks again, Vice Mayor. Thank you for coming. Thanks, Deb. Thank you, Vice Mayor and Councilwoman-elect O'Brien also. And with that, we wish you all a, a good evening and we'll see you back for virtual hearing number four and beyond. Thank you. <laughs>